I will now very briefly introduce the panelists. Robert Holtzmann is governor of the Österreichische Nationalbank, the Central Bank of Austria. Pierre Wunsch is the governor of the National Bank of Belgium. Alessandra Peracelli is the deputy governor of the Bank of Italy, Banca d'Italia. Lars Rode is the governor of Denmark's National Bank, the Danish Central Bank. To moderate these senior central bankers, we are grateful to the chair of the panel, the journalist Silvia Pavoni. Unfortunately, Olli Wren, the governor of the Bank of Finland, was unable to join the live panel, so he made a pre-recorded video instead, which shall be displayed now. Dear students uh, and other participants, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, uh, it is a great pleasure for me to speak at the Warwick Economics Summit uh, 2021 today. Let me comment uh, the organizers uh, for the choice of the subject uh, of this uh, session, cooperation and uh, indeed uh, interaction between monetary and fiscal policy is uh, one of the distinctive features uh, of the mostly successful policy response uh, to the COVID-19 crisis. In my brief remarks, uh, I will focus on two themes. First, uh, I will discuss the policy response uh, to the pandemic. Second, uh, I will provide you with uh, some views uh, on the monetary policy strategy review of the European Central Bank uh, that is currently underway. Economic policy response uh, to the COVID-19 crisis uh, has been swift and uh, forceful on a broad front. The ECB's uh, monetary policy is uh, strongly accommodative, as is uh, the fiscal policy of the euro area member states. There are two observations uh, regarding the crisis response uh, that I want to underline. First, uh, the policy mix. Uh, the devastating economic fallout uh, from the COVID-19 pandemic uh, combined with uh, constrained uh, policy space uh, forced uh, monetary and fiscal policymakers uh, to join forces uh, and uh, pull together. In these uh, exceptional circumstances, uh, the key role of uh, monetary policy is to ensure favorable financing conditions uh, while the task for fiscal policy is to support and boost demand. Due to the severity of the shock, very forceful fiscal measures have been and are justified to limit persistent damage to our economies and jobs. The crisis response has clearly demonstrated how monetary policy and fiscal policy can be and should be mutually reinforcing. Second, uh, it is uh, noteworthy that uh, national fiscal responses uh, are being augmented uh, at EU level. The European Union's uh, recovery instrument, uh, Next Generation EU, over 750 billion euros, will help mitigate uh, the economic and social impact uh, of the pandemic uh, while at the same time uh, providing funding for investments uh, to make uh, European economies uh, more sustainable and uh, better prepared uh, for the necessary green and uh, digital transitions. Most importantly, the breathing space uh, provided uh, by the highly accommodative policy mix uh, should now be utilized uh, wisely to ensure an enduring economic recovery. European policymakers in the member states of the Union should seize the opportunity for structural transformation and accelerate the needed transformation to lower carbon dependence. This is critical also for securing longer term fiscal sustainability in the face of uh, increasing public debt. Let me now turn to the ECB's uh, monetary policy strategy review. The underlying reason for the review is the profound uh, structural changes uh, in the world economy. These uh, include uh, the change uh, in the relationship uh, between the spare capacity of the economy and inflation, 
related to the Phillips curve and it's flattening the fall in the natural interest rate uh, or the equilibrium interest rate uh, and uh, sluggish uh, productivity growth uh, across the globe. A reassessment uh, of the ECB's uh, monetary policy strategy is uh, all the more important uh, given the damage wrought by the COVID-19 pandemic. The long-term decline in uh, natural interest rates uh, has uh, left uh, less room for interest rate cuts uh, with the effective lower bound uh, laying the floor. Although the so-called uh, unconventional monetary policy measures uh, that have become actually rather conventional have been able to alleviate uh, this constraint uh, to some extent. One of the key issues of the review is the question of uh, correctly anchoring inflation expectations. While our formulation, current formulation of the inflation target uh, below but uh, close to 2% uh, was fit for purpose uh, in driving down uh, higher than desired uh, inflation in the early 2000s, uh, it has also generated uh, a perception of uh, asymmetry and ambiguity of the target. In the current environment of uh, chronically low inflation, this uh, ambiguity is uh, hampering the effectiveness uh, of uh, monetary policy. Therefore, to succeed in uh, fulfilling our mandate, uh, it is critical that we make sure that the inflation target is uh, understood uh, as uh, symmetric uh, by the public. In my personal view, there are two components uh, to accomplish this. Uh, First, uh, we need a clear and uh, genuinely symmetric uh, definition of uh, our price stability target uh, at 2%. Second, uh, we need a reaction function that uh, delivers uh, sufficiently forceful and equally effective policy actions uh, to deviations uh, from the target uh, to both directions. In a world uh, where the economy faces uh, the effective lower bound uh, more often than in the past, uh, the way to guide uh, longer term inflation expectations uh, up to the target, uh, converts to the target, uh, is to allow actual inflation to exceed the target uh, for some time following periods of uh, persistently low inflation. Overall, the strategy review needs to cover a wide range of topics and be supported by thorough analysis of the forces that drive inflation dynamics today. As policymakers, we need to base our decisions on both economic theory and empirical evidence and remain open to fresh thinking. As an example, let me mention two different interpretations of the impact of global megatrends uh, on the natural interest rate uh, and uh, future inflation. Based on uh, an empirical analysis uh, employing historical data on, on Europe uh, from the Black Death uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, Oscar Yorda, Sanjay Singh and uh, Alan Taylor argue that uh, pandemics uh, like uh, COVID-19 have long-lasting negative effects uh, on the natural rate, uh, lowering effects, uh, effects on the natural rate, uh, reflecting the lack of uh, needed investment, uh, an increased uh, desire to save, uh, or both of these factors. On the other hand, uh, in a recent book, uh, Charles Goodhart uh, and uh, Manuel Bradhan reads an opposite uh, conclusion. They argue that uh, global population, population aging and uh, personing depend dependency ratios uh, around the world, uh, not least in China, lead to increased uh, inflation pressures through multiple channels, uh, including labor shortages uh, driving up the bargaining power of labor relative to capital, a larger share of uh, non-productive population dampening deflationary pressures, and uh, increasing healthcare expenditure needs. 
based on uh, comparative probability analysis, uh, my view is uh, closer to the low for long narrative with a focus on uh, very low inflation expectations. Nevertheless, uh, I have found uh, Goodhart uh, and uh, Bradhan's uh, argumentation very refreshing. Whether or not uh, their predictions uh, will hit the mark uh, is another issue, but it is important that uh, critical questions uh, are raised uh, and backed by analysis. It will force uh, reflection on widely held uh, assumptions uh, on future developments uh, and uh, <clears throat> indeed uh, the continuous uh, evolution of uh, our operational environment, uh, not to speak of uh, potential reversals uh, in some global megatrends, uh, is a compelling reason for the ECB to regularly review its uh, monetary policy framework, uh, for instance, uh, every five years. This would enable us uh, to recognize uh, the impacts of uh, key structural developments uh, on the operating environment of monetary policy and uh, thus uh, allow us to regularly revisit uh, our strategy as appropriate uh, so that monetary policy will remain fit for purpose. Dear friends, uh, let me conclude. Faced with the, the unprecedented uh, blow to the global economy, monetary and uh, fiscal policy makers uh, have had to join forces uh, to deliver a crisis response uh, that is commensurate uh, with the shock. Forceful policy measures uh, have been justified uh, and indeed, uh, in my view, necessary to limit uh, persistent uh, damage uh, to our economies, our jobs, uh, our businesses, our households. Effective uh, fiscal and monetary policy support uh, should be continued uh, until the recovery of uh, economic activity is uh, firmly and uh, solidly underway. At the same time, COVID-19 has uh, highlighted uh, the impact of longer-run structural trends uh, that uh, policy makers uh, need to take into attention and uh, into account. This holds uh, for the ECB's uh, monetary policy and its uh, strategy as well. I underlined uh, the importance of uh, revisiting and uh, clearly recalibrating our inflation target uh, in the current uh, low inflation environment. With the help of the strategy review, the European Central Bank uh, and its monetary policy can uh, better support uh, sustainable growth and employment uh, and also help achieve uh, the inflation target uh, in the coming years. I will stop here and uh, I want to wish you all a great conference uh, and uh, inspiring discussions. Uh, please stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Thank you to Oli Ren for setting the tone for this exciting panel. I now leave the floor to Silvia Pavoni to conduct, to conduct the live panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Marius, and thank you again to, uh, to the um, to Warwick University for having invited me to, to moderate this panel discussion. Um, we have, as you've heard and as you've seen, uh, a fantastic lineup of, uh, of speakers to uh, take us through what it means to be in charge of a monetary uh, policy institution at the moment and the relationship, the joining forces that uh, we've heard uh, Oliver uh, talking about earlier, the joining forces between monetary and uh, fiscal policies at time of crisis. So the question that I would like to, uh, to pose to our uh, panelists, Robert Holtzman from the Central Bank of Austria, uh, Pierre Wunsch, uh, Central Bank of uh, Belgium, and Alessandra Pirazzelli, Bank of Italy, is how long is this um, relationship uh, going to stay as it is and, and what it means for the future of monetary policy to other points that were raised towards that uh, definitely, I think, uh, underscore uh, 
the uh, challenges of the moment for central banks uh, that were mentioned uh, during Mr. Ryan's presentation were the unconventionality of such certain measures which now have become perhaps more conventional and accepted and the ambiguity of targets. Um, let's start with some, some initial thoughts from Mr. Holtzman. Can you hear me? We can, yes. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Sylvie. Thanks, sir, uh, for the invitation. Good evening, students and other participants interested in the topic. It's great being back uh, in a university environment, even if only in an uh, electronic format. Uh, to answer uh, Sylvie's uh, question, I will also uh, uh, somewhat expose the relationship between monetary and fiscal policy as the successful in the action is critical for dealing with the shock and the, uh, the fallout thereafter. And um, I can build a little bit on what Orivain has said there, uh, so I can be sure that has been asked uh, since uh, we have uh, more limited time. But I need to uh, first, I think, uh, Twelve a little bit into the history. As uh, you know, the interaction between money and fiscal policy is now back in academic research and broad policy discourse. Uh, it was very much part of lectures and textbook when I was a student some 50 plus years ago. And back then, the questions were more basic but still relevant. Uh, today, uh, what policy instruments should be assigned to which objective and the assignment changes across time, exchange rate, the uh, stressing of other factors such as the credibility of uh, policy and uh, the uh, institution behind it. Uh, it's important to understand the discussion that uh, recently the discussion has moved uh, uh, from uh, uh, considering money and fiscal policy as strategic substitutes. Uh, uh, so where you make state contingent decision, what you want to use, uh, to think of both policy as strategic complements. Uh, so where with appropriate design and interaction, each instrument can be expanded the policy space of the other. So for example, importantly, Accommodating monetary policy with low rates of interest allows fiscal policy to expand its policy scope. And in turn, of course, uh, fiscal policy action helps the economy to recover, so taking away some of the person from central banks. Now, this re-emergence of interest in policy coordination happens, of course, and this one has to keep in mind, in the aftermath of stressing the importance of independent central banks and the pursuit of a narrow policy objective to be effective and credible. So uh, the empirical analysis over the last decades on the effectiveness of post policies uh, uh, to uh, address shocks suggest somewhat slightly better outcome for monetary policy than to, for fiscal policy, but very little existence of a complementary approach. Now, this leads me to a second part, which I will cut short. Here, the question is, if you look into, uh, against this background of a suboptimal individual policy approach and also a joint policy approach, has this changed more recently? And Oli Rehn had somewhat elaborated uh, on what has happened in recent uh, uh, months or last one and a half years. And you could see a very strong action uh, by the, uh, European Central Bank to take this example, but you can also use uh, the Fed and others. And there are also a, uh, a strong reaction by member countries of uh, the European monetary area. And there, um, a lot of money has been put on the table. So assessed against the policy reaction, the aftermath of GFC, both recent monetary and fiscal policies have been much more forthcoming. But, and here I differ from Ole Rehn with the question, will they be able to offer a long-term perspective in the view of the decisive importance offer 
the equilibrium interest rate R star for both options. I return uh, to uh, this uh, uh, variable. Uh, this leads me to the third and final part, uh, because uh, I think uh, uh, the important is to understand that two key policy option policymakers have to decide on in the areas of monetary policy. Option one, this is to consider a star. This is a hypothetical and estimated equilibrium interest rate as exogenous and low and even negative far into the future. If this is the case, fiscal policy will be encouraged to remain generous as interest payments remain low and hence uh, fiscal sustainability appears not an issue. Monetary policy will remain unconventional as conventional policy based on interest rates and forward guidance only will not work. And in case of further economic shocks, more of the same will need to be applied if, in, if inflation stay low. However, if inflation were to increase, sir, raising nominal interest rate will threaten fiscal sustainability if monetary policy lives up to its aims. Hence, one would live in a fragile equilibrium without an exit strategy. Option two, which I favor, is to consider a star as an endogenous variable that is accessible to policy interventions and can be raised perhaps back to levels seen in the past. If this is or were to achieve, though, it would allow a return to conventional monetary policy without side effects from unconventional policies and allow reduced balance sheets of central banks. Mm. It would promise growing income as a rise in our star would be a large start to be the result of rising productivity. It would require keeping a lid on the public deficit and debt. In short, it offers an exit option from the current policy mix. Achieving a rise in our star will first of all require better understanding what are the drivers for the secular fall in the case. Yet I think two policy interventions can be explored right away. Measures to increase productivity and clever fiscal policy and decisive for structural reforms will have to play a major role. So policy interaction is required. And measures to reduce the saving overhang from the global north in view of the capital needs of the global south, something what we heard also before in the session with Joe Stiglitz and uh, uh, Ravi and others. Both policy measures are desirable and useful independently on the effect of ASTA on the equilibrium interest rate. In a recent report, ASTA was called a global public good, and I concur. So, summary in the short run, option one holds true, as ASTA cannot be changed swiftly. In the long run, hopefully, option two is realized, provided forceful actions are taken. And as we know, every voyage starts with a step. So perhaps this step can be a green one. Back to you, I stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holzman. Um, so again, we're back to um, how uh, challenging and uncharted these waters are for, for central banks. And of course, central banks traditionally, as you rightly pointed out uh, at the beginning of, of, um, of your initial remarks, um, they've always been praised uh, for being independent. So independence has been um, seen as uh, the indicator of the maturity of a certain jurisdiction when it comes to its monetary um, authority. But of course, th this crisis is highlighting actually the need of perhaps being more flexible uh, when it comes to the relationship with, uh, um, with uh, at least fiscal uh, policy. And so um, very interesting to hear your views on what might happen and what should happen in the short uh, medium term and, and later on as we hopefully leave uh, uh, this uh, situation. Very interested in hearing also what uh, Mr. Wish thinks about the current um, scenario and what we should expect from uh, central banks and from the perhaps the ECB as well in terms of uh, navigating these, uh, these times and the relationship, the evolving 
somehow a somewhat relationship between uh, again monetary and fiscal policy and how low and how how much lower and how how much longer uh, can interest rates stay uh, thank you uh, on, on the last question maybe to start with that the honest answer is I don't know because, because of course it's, it's going to be and that's very clear in our uh, um, uh, policy it was going to depend on the inflation developments because uh, of course, we have committed to uh, to support the economy and uh, in order to get to a higher inflation. But maybe to, to get back to your um, uh, question about the interaction with, with fiscal, and I, I would like to start with a sort of story. A year ago, I was presenting the um, uh, the report of the of the National Bank of Belgium, and and my challenge was to explain why we needed inflation closer to two percent, and why a low inflation is actually a problem. And I was trying to explain that uh, we need to raise inflation so that we have more room for maneuver when uh, we are faced with a shock to reduce real interest rates because when inflation is higher, we can actually have uh, lower real interest rates. And I was saying, you know, at some point we will have another crisis and it was a year ago, uh, we will have another crisis and we want to make sure that we go back to 2% so that we can face that next crisis. Well, the bad news is the crisis came two months later uh, so we didn't have time to build the buffers and go back to 2%. But, but the positive news is that we were able to manage this crisis, and I think quite well. Um, and it was, in, in fact, if not coordinated, uh, a, 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 through the action of monetary authorities, prudential authorities, and fiscal authorities, that we could avoid a complete, uh, uh, basically, uh, you know, fall into a very deep recession of our economies. Now, this points to the fact that when you are close to the, to the effective lower bound, maybe uh, monetary policy and uh, maybe is indeed less effective or our capacity to, to support the private sector through you know, more ambitious policies is reduced because we start from a lower level. But that there is a sort of automatic stabilizer in that uh, to the extent that it corresponds to a, a deep recession or a risk of a deep recession, the fiscal authorities would then to some extent uh, take the lead, or that we would allow them to uh, be part of the answer. So this is not um, coordination in the sense that we would formally coordinate, but there, there is a sort of, uh, maybe another sort of divine coincidence that when we are closer to the effective lower bound, part of the uh, effectiveness of uh, monetary policy is indeed that it facilitates uh, a reaction of uh, the fiscal authorities. So from that perspective, in guess, I guess what we are experiencing today is quite reassuring. What are the lessons uh, of that uh, for the future? Um, I think we still have to, to draw the lessons. Uh, but again, I mean, as long as we are in the situation where it's obvious that uh, the economy still needs to be sustained, uh, I mean, the objectives are aligned. We need to push the economy uh, uh, to higher levels of activity, to push the uh, inflation also uh, to a higher level. And so, I mean, this is in a way the easy part of the crisis. Everybody is, you know, moving in the same direction. Where it could become more difficult is indeed if what we are doing, when we have a recovery, would not lead quickly or quickly enough to recovery in inflation. This is not our base case. Our base case is that, and that, that's what why we do it. By the way, is that we believe it's going to have a positive impact on inflation. But okay, uh, there, are, there are people saying, you know, we might be faced with not only um, a flat uh, Phillips curve, but also a steep IS curve, and that our capacity to uh, have a, a big impact through monetary policy on the private sector investments and, and others and consumption might be lower than in the past. I don't know if it's the case. Uh, we hope it's not. But to the extent it would be the case, we might at some point be faced with more difficult trade-offs. But again, this is not the, biggest, the base case. And today, it's, it's in a way the easy part. So, so your base case remain rather well optimistic. I guess we all need to be a little bit optimistic in, in what we do in terms of what um, what needs to be done is happening, uh, or what you can do. You're doing at the moment, but the future, of course, is very much unpredictable. By definition, but perhaps even more so. 
um, under the current circumstances and very and very fluid. Uh, there are already many questions actually coming through. So what I'm trying to do, but, but first, of course, I want to hear from from Ms. Berzali. Um, but just to let the, our audience know, because there's so many so many questions. So I can see that we have we do have a really keen audience, um, and I will start actually putting those questions to you after we've heard from, from Ms. Barazzelli. Um, and so um, again, for our lovely audience, keep on putting those questions. Do, do not miss the chance to ask, uh, to ask uh, our experts um, uh, whatever comes through your mind as you are, of course, looking at these, um, these uh, subjects for your studies. Ms. Barazzelli, so central banks, uh, the theory of, of what central banks are is perhaps a little bit at odds with the realities of, of the current situation. Uh, in addition to that, there are so many, so many other pressures, some of them we're going to touch later on, um, which deal with, uh, um, with climate change related risk, for example, and the role that central banks can play in dealing with them and also um, uh, uh, trying to help to move towards a more sustainable uh, economic growth. But th there is also the digital side of uh, um, of uh, the financial markets and then of course the Bank of England, uh, the Bank of Italy, <laughs> pardon me, the Bank of Italy has been, uh, uh, has been, we can, we can talk about the Bank of England as well later on in terms of oh, green stress so testing. Very active, very active, very active in the, in the, in the, in the I'm, digital I'm taking world. You, <laughs> taking you away from Italy and, and giving you a new job. <laughs> uh, but no, Ms. Pratelli, so Keep, tell us about your views on, on um, what's happening in terms of the relationship between um, monetary and fiscal policy, but also keen to, to hear about the developments that uh, the Bank of England has, again, the Bank of Italy. That is, it's, it, it's there. <laughs> the, the Bank of Italy is beheaded in Italy in terms of uh, digital technology and the modernization of the, of the banking sector. Sure, thank you, Silvia. And, and good evening to all, to all, to all the students. I'm very happy to to be here with you uh, uh, tonight. I mean, I, um, we're in a virtual room, but it's nice to think that, you know, the, the young ones of today come together with the young ones of a few years ago. You know, we're, we're just here to, we're holding the helm now, but it's gonna be you in a few years that are gonna take our place. And that's a it's nice thing to think of. Um, well, you know, I like to start, I like to, to mention pretty much the, uh, the role that we're having right now in, um, you know, and helping in modernize the, the financial sector, this is pretty something that has been pretty much the center of my um, activity. Uh, I look after banks. I'm, you know, I'm at the head of the supervisory arm of the um, uh, Banca d'Italia, and uh, and I sit in that uh, in the supervisory board of the SSM as well. But I'm also looking at the way in which the Industry is changing. I come from industry, um, and um, you know, and I come from um, uh, the banking industry. Part of the banking industry that you know tried in the in the last years to to really uh, change the business model and introduce technology as part of um, you know a a real um, a change in perspective on how to use platforms in order to to offer services and to uh, modernize um, the, uh, you know, the, the, um, the way in which consumers are relating to banking and, and, and the financial world. Now, um, as central banker, uh, you, know, we're, we, you know, we see these challenges emerging every day, um, you know, payment systems running on private, uh, DLTs, we're seeing today uh, Visa launching uh, Bitcoins and, um, you know, all sorts of decentralized uh, finance that um, allows, you know, people to, to engage in financial services uh, without intermediaries. Um, and then all that it's the ethical implication of the artificial intelligence. It, it's, it's every day that we learn about innovation and uh, and that calls into question, you know, the, the notion that in the financial world, uh, you know, have been considered the norm for, for, for years and for generations. And we're right, you know, in, in, in the, we're right in the eye of the storm of FinTech and, uh, you know, and we have to come up with answers to, to questions that, um, on how to regulate and what we're going to regulate and you know and this is a pretty interesting question that has to be at the core of what we do 
um, as supervisors uh, right now. And the, you know, and since life it's, 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 it, it isn't about waiting for the storm to pass, but it's pretty much learning how to dance in that rain, you know, even, even us as central banks, uh, you know, we have to learn how to dance in the rain and, and, and we are developing uh, new ways to cope with the challenges that are brought by the storm of innovation. The, for example, right now we're witnessing the adoption by central banks all over the globe of new policy tools such as sandboxes, uh, innovation hubs, and these new tools, you know, they're called innovation facilitators and they're meant to be, uh, you know, ways in which central banks stay abreast of technology and market developments and, you know, while over, you know, overlooking the evolution of the sector and learning how to manage new macro and micro prudential risks. So, um, uh, you know, these type of facilitators will play a very important role in testing the impact of innovation in a closed environment and encouraging the spread of also responsible innovation in the financial system. So these new instruments, you know, um, will help central banks to address more effectively the regulatory and the supervisory concerns that are raised by the new FinTech challenges. So getting to know innovation from up close may improve, you know, for you know, it, as an example, the in you know designing rules uh, that are fit for new uh, business models. They are based on platforms on on digitalization. So, um, in the Bank of Italy, pretty much like the Bank of England, I have to say, <laughs> um, we have set up um, an innovation hub, which is called Canale FinTech, and that is the way in, you know, so uh, operators can present projects and, uh, and have an open dialogue with us on technology and regulation and compliance issues. And also we have launched recently a, a, a hub in Milan, um, which is a new, a new way to foster, you know, co collaboration with the academia and uh, with all the different stakeholders, you know, market operators and uh, other uh, public sector authorities, you know, technological universities, so on and so forth. So this is um, a way to share knowledge and uh, facilitate the development of a, of, of a safe and sound um, innovative fintech uh, world. Um, um, now, the, the other issue that we're pretty much working on right now is exploring the world of digital currencies, you know, to evaluate whether the application of this cutting edge technology such as DLT um, may improve uh, financial inclusion and, um, and enhance the, also the economic monitoring and monetary policies. So the, you know, like the digital euro project that is under development right now in the ECB, it's, um, you know, will we'll prove, you know, the, the willingness of uh, central banks to move forward and to, and to adapt to a, a, a new digital world. Now, um, you know, I think it's useful to remember that um, Innovation facilitators and projects like the digital euro are means to improve central bank traditional functions, and they're, they're not ends, you know, in, in themselves. And you know, at the end of the day, future central bankers, so you know, students that are listening to us tonight, will use these tools to to keep doing what what we've been doing for ages. So, which is to ensure monetary and financial stability. To, to for for you know a lasting uh, growth of um, of the economy. So I stop you, here, you, Sylvia. Thank you. No, you've actually answered a few of the questions that came through about the digitalization of of currency. So I'm just trying to to group all these questions and introduce them in in my next uh, question to to our panelists. So you, you, you covered the okay. digitalization of, um, again of. Um, of currencies um, uh, and this really again highlights the the changing role of uh, monetary authorities so now central banks have sandboxes where you allow innovation to to develop in a relatively controlled environment uh, again central banks being called on uh, perhaps even um, uh, funding um, uh, companies um, 
and initiatives that uh, <clears throat> have a green element through the asset purchase mechanism and again the dependence um, between monetary and fiscal um, policy is uh, being relaxed in times of crisis and so one of the questions that came through is whether you feel that this should be reflected and is it reflected in in the syllabus um in uh, uh, th that's um economic students studying so what what was the what would you say to this to the students that listen to us and perhaps are actually listening to a, a studying a syllabus that reflects the the old way of uh the previous way of thinking well i i think that we're we're you know going towards a world where there's going to be lots of need for contamination and and lots of um, you know, understanding of other sides uh, of um, not only of the, you know, economics, but also of technology. And I think that these two things will, you know, I see it, I can give you an example, you know, I see it the way in which we're working right now in the Bank of Italy, you know, the, we're trying really to get rid of this silos approach whereby issues are looked at, you know, from very, the, the different views. And we're trying to use technology as a means to create a mainstream attitude towards new services and newcomers. You know, they're, they're you know, one, you know, we get uh, operators that ask for licenses. And if we look at them, you know, we're really like, we don't know what kind of an animal that is. You know, sometimes there are machines, you know, they are, they have no people inside, but they are able to provide all sorts of services. And so they, they really do not fit into uh, the rules that have been thought for in analogic world. Yes. So, you know, and so there is a need, I think, to complement education with sorts of all different uh, views and, um, and subjects that do, do come sometimes from technology, do come sometimes for, you know, um, uh, other branches of, of, uh, of the law, for instance, the ability to understand the role, for instance, right now of uh, algorithms and coding into, you know, the life of, uh, of a regulator. Um, mm. I think that we're moving towards a pretty much more contaminated way of, of looking at these issues compared to the way, you know, when I went to university and, you know, and, um, and I was studying things in a much more sort of like compartment uh, uh, diversified way you know in, yes. com in compartments and uh, definitely useful to take inspiration from I guess from other disciplines yeah, well. exactly one of the other questions that came that came in is about um, um, whether uh, perhaps uh, we should uh, focus on uh, the, the right uh, balance between focusing on financing new companies growth companies um, and supporting the existing ones, and again, and I wonder whether this is a question that has to do with uh, should we uh, continue with fiscal stimulus, or should we also look at um, creative destruction? Uh, which of these two ways should we go? Maybe uh, interested to to hear Mr. Holzman's way on this. Yeah, this is an important question, but uh, I don't think uh, this is an alternative. Uh, because on the one hand, what you need to have is a public support. If you're in such a deep crisis, you need public support in order to move out of the crisis. And uh, the actions so far across Europe have shown that the public was able uh, to support uh, companies uh, during these uh, difficult periods of uh, lockdown that they are. Uh, but uh, putting money on the table and now in the future, is not sufficient. There's also the need for dynamism among the private enterprises, because not all will survive. There are many that can survive. And here, a critical question across all of Europe is the question, will these companies and how do these companies get equity capital? Because sir, Equity capital is easy to pronounce, sir. but as we have seen in Europe, uh, after so many years of discussion, the capital union is still not here because uh, we are lacking uh, the mechanisms, except a few countries uh, where you have a broad supply of capital, which can generate uh, into supply for capital for small enterprises. So I think the critical part out of the crisis 
besides how to say the monetary and fiscal uh, uh, interaction is uh, to find ways and means to recapitalize a number of the enterprises because only offer them uh, credits uh, may not be sufficient. They have to be paid uh, one of them over and there's always the danger that inflation goes up and the interest rate goes up. Yeah. And here, uh, uh, what uh, uh, the Italian colleague has said, I think it's very much true. In the past, I think uh, life of a central banker was uh, easier and I think boring because it was a question of uh, interest up, interest down, and that's it. Nowadays, you have to know the uh, parts of technology, uh, uh, the supervision of uh, financial market institution. You have to be versatile in CBDC, in payment system and other. And this offers, how to say what I was mentioned, uh, uh, much more stimulating uh, uh, work, but also have to say it makes the days longer, uh, but it's very stimulating, yes. Thank you. So th th thank you. So um, so central banking, definitely not a boring job any longer. Perhaps we can even say it's becoming a sexy job. Um, but uh, a question for, for Mr. Wunsch. So again, we, we mentioned uh, the role that uh, monetary, poly monetary institutions have in uh, dealing with climate related um, risks. How, where is exactly the place of um, central banks in this discussion? So clearly, this is a risk that would have an impact uh, and has an impact on, on financial stability. So that is definitely under the mandates of central banks. But when it comes to maybe encouraging or pushing the markets to price what they uh, believe is a correct way, in a correct way, um, climate related risk, is that something the central bank should do? What about purchasing green assets, which is uh, obviously something that the ECB is, is um, being very vocal about? Um, is where is the the right uh the but where we're going to find the balance in in all of this and is there any balance that we can actually recognize given how new and fresh uh this debate still is well it's it's very interesting discussion and it's uh, also a discussion we are going to have in our strategic review so i don't want to uh <laughs> maybe to to be too not going to give about what we are going to do uh, I believe there are a number of no-brainers. Uh, we just need to understand better what's going to, to be the impact on the economy, on inflation, on growth. Uh, that is, uh, you know, in our traditional role of understanding the, the working of the economy. And we really, we have a lot to learn. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not very easy to, to understand what the ramifications are going to be to, to go to a, a transition towards a green economy. Of course, uh, in... Um, with regard to financial stability, uh, we want to make sure that banks take into account the risk of not only climate change uh, per se, so the impact on, on you know, on uh, I would say the, the natural impacts that, that they could have on the economy, but also the impact of the transition measures that we are going to take. And and then we we move to to issues that are a bit that are a bit more tricky. Uh, let's say uh, let's assume that building uh, coal uh, power plants is incompatible with uh, you know getting to uh, zero carbon economy in 2050 well one question you might raise is if it's incompatible with objectives we had it should be forbidden you know full stop then if it's not forbidden why is it not forbidden and is it our role to say well we are not going to be part of that now we are independent, so we are not elected uh, officials. So, you know, one part of the discussion is, can we make up for decisions that should be taken place or should be taken by politi politicians? And if they don't take them, uh, should we then in a way politicize uh, the, uh, the way uh, monetary policy is working? So that's one issue. And of course, the more, um, for instance, the, the clearer uh, prices are, I mean, if you, you could even say if carbon is well priced, then we don't have an issue anymore. I mean, I'm, I was trained as a public economist. I mean, you know, an externality should be dealt with with a Peruvian tax, uh, basically. So we should have a, a price for carbon. But you could say if we have a correct price for carbon, it's going to deal with all the rest. Now, if you don't have a correct price for carbon, then to what extent can and should monetary authorities try to you know, find a sort of alternative. Well, you first have to understand why don't we have a good price for carbon? If it's because politicians can't agree, then is it our role to do it? 
So it certainly doesn't mean that we should do nothing, but it, it leads you to, uh, you know, difficult discussions on to what extent can we replace or substitute for political decisions uh, while we are independent. I mean, independence should come with a very clear and in fact, in fact limited mandate. Uh, and if we want to broaden our mandate, at some point we will have a problem and we will want to have uh, basically the, the, the political support for, for doing that. So um, very challenging and interesting discussion. And maybe another one that I would like to mention, and this is really for the long run. I mean, we, we need to make sure that we get there, uh, you know, 2050 is now the, the target date. Well, hopefully we're not going to do QE for 30 years. I mean, the aim of QE is to bring inflation back to 2%. If you tell me it's going to last 30 years, well, we have a problem. So I think it would be wrong to give the impression that we are going to be in the market for the next 30 years and that we are going to be a big part of the solution. Then again, if you tell me we should not build uh, coal fired plants, uh, uh, um, coal fired power plants uh, in the coming years, and this is clear and this is clearly incompatible with policies at European level, I would be inclined, inclined to draw the conclusion in terms of our monetary policy. But then anyway, I mean, we're not going to build them. So this raises again the role that uh, central banks can play also in helping politicians with the right models to understand what is compatible with what scenario, because there is also very much a, a lack of understanding on not so yeah, much- To me, that's, that's really the no-brainer part of it. I mean, uh, I would really want to understand much better how long is the transition going to be to electric cars or hydrogen cars, uh, whether electric pr electricity prices, which are going to be, you know, uh, reflecting um, greener production are going to go up or down. Uh, and this is going to have uh, possibly an impact on economic growth, possibly an impact on inflation. And so this is really something we need to invest on. And, and that's, I mean, that's a no brainer part of the discussion, I guess. And we're doing it. I mean, we are, I'm, I'm hiring now people to, in our uh, research department to understand it better. To understand it better. So that's one of the roles, perhaps uh, one of the new roles that, uh, again, central banks can play in, in helping the discussion. We still have a few minutes. Um, and so we'd like um, now to ask a question that, of course, naturally, uh, when we start talking about monetary fiscal policy um, and the uh, the de dealing with the, with the crisis, it's natural that we're also uh, going to wonder are the corona bonds that we've issued um, a precursor to um, to a fiscal union across um, across the uh, uh, the region? Big question, of course, but but is that the direction of travel? Who is brave enough to go first? Well, I can give it a try if you want. Uh, I really believe it's going to depend very much on how the money is being used. Um, so I think this is this is one ammunition we have. We don't have so many of them. If the money is very well used and allows for um, you know a better policies to be implemented in a number of countries, convergence between a number of countries. I mean, Italy is probably a case in point. Then it will be a success story, and the success story brings uh, more of the same. Uh, hopefully, um, if the money is not a game changer and it's you know, having an impact, but not that much of an impact, um, then I don't know. I, I, I think to, to, to put it, to frame the discussion maybe a little bit differently is that I think crises are very, the way we, we react to crisis is very much state dependent. The last crisis began with Greece being in trouble, but, but to some extent having cheated with the rules. Now, that makes it very difficult to say, okay, let's forget about you know, what you committed to, about the fact that you did not um, respect the rules, we are going to give you money. It takes time, it's difficult. When the crisis starts by uh, pictures of people in hospitals in Northern Italy, not having access to uh, healthcare or uh, you know, people dying, the attitude is very different. So I think we, we need to pay attention to the fact that what politically feasible is depends very much on the circumstances. The circumstances were, were to some extent tragically dif difficult in the financial crisis, during the financial crisis. And they were in a way politically much more favorable this time. So again, it depends on 
the circumstances. I would not take as a rule that uh, you know the, the way we deal with one crisis has uh, very strong implications for the next one. But also, of course, it's going to depend on the success of the policies that are being conducted. Thank you. So perhaps this is a crisis that is uniting uh, Europe as a region in, in spirit uh, more, more than others. Although, of course, there still are there still is some bickering uh, between countries uh, of, of various uh, nature. Uh, Ms. Paracelli, what do you think? Well, I, I, I you know, I, I agree with, with Pierre. I think that there is a lot to say about the way in which money is going to be spent and the way in which, you know, it's going to be put at, uh, you know, recreating those uh, um, common grounds that can take us then to a, a next step of a fiscal union, uh, a, um, and also, you know, a, a different uh, approach to, to budget uh, for the future. I think that we are, you know, taking aside all the, the, the loss and the pain that this pandemic has created, you know, we all lost someone and, uh, you know, if, if only the economic impact and the social impact, but I think we are facing an amazing opportunity as Europe right now. And I like to, to, to look at this as a, a very starting and a very changing moment of our lives uh, where there is a lot to do, uh, but also a renewed approach towards, towards Europe. Right now, I have to say, I've been thinking about this and talking to you know, many different people and to lots of young ones, to my kids as well. You know, there, I, 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 I think that there is no other place I would like to be right now uh, but in Europe, uh, in terms of the way in which we dealt with the pandemic, in terms of also the protection that we gave to people. Um, looking again at digital right now, you know, we're look, we're, there's been all this uh, talking about what WhatsApp is going to do with Facebook and our data are going to be on servers around the world. Well, this is not happening here. So I, I have to say, you know, despite the pain and the difficulties and the reconstruction, uh, I think we are facing a moment that could be very much lead the next generation uh, of Europe onto something uh, very, very interesting. Um, you know, it depends on um, what we implement in terms of rules, uh, what we do with the money, how quick we are in terms of uh, reconstructing the, uh, the basic for, you know, sustainable growth. But I have to say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm quite positive about it. I think this is a lovely way to uh, to get to the near of this panel. I would like to give a chance to Mr. Holtzman also to share a few final uh, remarks. Are you feeling as optimistic uh, and as hopeful about uh, the future of Europe? I'm always an optimist and I'm a 100% European, but I also remain a realist. And I thought your question to Alessandra would be whether she believes that uh, Mr. Draghi can deliver also in his new position, uh, because uh, I think uh, uh, this will be an assignment which is critical to garner this support uh, in Europe. I don't think we have two possibilities uh, uh, of this size uh, to offer money. So I see very much now really, really the owners uh, on now on the future telling government uh, to provide the programs which are able to provide finally productivity in Italy. And this links back to how I started my intervention. Uh, without uh, productivity growth, uh, I don't think how to say uh, a number of the problems can be solved, particularly some countries with a lot of debt. And so, and this happens at, not automatically. And so in order to really get the best out of it, now fiscal policy, structural policy have to deliver. And I wish uh, Mario Draghi all the best uh, being able to do so. Uh, to say we all love Italy, but uh, we all have to say, hope they finally get the act together. And when this happens, then I think uh, we are able to be much more optimistic. So hopefully this is a moment in which everyone pulls together, as you say, and so we, we all level up. Um, so we've got to the end of this panel. Thank you so much to all the to all our fantastic uh, 
panelists, but also to the audience who've been so lively. And again, I've tried to group together as many questions as possible and put them to, um, to uh, our speakers. I also would like to remind you, it may not have been uh, said at the beginning. So I am a financial journalist and I write for a magazine called The Banker. So if any of you uh, students watching this or anyone else watching this is interesting in finding out what central bankers, because we do speak to a lot of central bankers, not just in Europe, but really across the world, including from uh, Brazil to, to India, um, uh, Russia, South Africa, and, and many more, many other places. Do uh, come and have a look at our content. It's, um, Free to read if you register. So just go to thebanker.com and register. You, you, you can have access to three articles a month. So I'm doing a little uh, <laughs> a little publicity to the magazine. But hopefully, this is also going to be interesting and useful uh, to uh, everyone, the students in particular, watching this. Thank you again. A big thank you to the panelists and the chair for an enthralling discussion and QA. Hearing about different recipes and perspectives for the European economy was really interesting. I'd uh, just like to note that Dr. Pierre Wunsch's Meet the Speak session has been rescheduled, and you'll be notified about that very shortly. <laughs>